So we have Robert Buck, who will be talking about uh, his experience uh, developing a runner using Go language, a Beam runner. And, uh, Robert has been working on Beam for quite some time, and is the primary contributor to uh, Beam Go SDK. Uh, he's a Beam committer and also an engineer at uh, Google. Hi, everybody, and welcome to Oops, I actually wrote a portable Beam runner in Go. Uh, so at Beam Summit last year, I had a talk titled, Oops, I wrote a portable Beam runner in Go. And unfortunately, due to the way timelines kind of work, where things always kind of just get away from you, I didn't actually have anything real to show last year uh, because I was busy doing other things. So I didn't get as far as I really wanted to by Beam Summit last year. Not so this year. Things got away from me, but I do have something to show you, which is very nice. So hence the reprise of actually wrote a Beam Portable Runner. Uh, so I'm Robert Burke. I am the TL for the Beam Go SDK at Google. I'm a committer. Uh, I'm the self-styled Beam Go busybody on the Beam dev list, constantly throwing in any bit of Go content I can whenever it's applicable uh, to whatever threads um, work largely doing Beam and Go stuff, um, but otherwise play video games and like traveling. Um, so what I'm going to cover off today, because I only have a good 20 or so minutes, is briefly the state of the Go SDK 2023, because we don't need a full dedicated talk for that this year. Uh, the goals of the runner I'm writing, uh, what the, the naming of the runner itself, the features that we've currently got are in progress, and what will where I kind of want the end goal to be, a demo, and an architecture overview. And then hopefully, there'll be some times for questions afterwards. So uh, now for a brief state of the Go SDK. As of 249, the SDK is nominally kind of feature complete outside of like in terms of core Beam features, because we'll end up having a proper timer API finally uh, to go along with what already exists in the last year of a state API, um, as well as a bunch of contributions from some folks that were not me or my team at Google, including a periodic impulse and sequence, as well as support for slowly changing side inputs, additional abstractions for file I.O. It's been a long time coming, but as you might have seen at John Casey's talk this morning, writing an I.O. IOs is very hard, so it took a while to get them right. An improvement to the spanner I.O. in order to uh, allow them to uh, scalably uh, read from uh, those data sources. Same thing for MongoDB as well as, in the last year, some additional uh, support for cross-language from Python, notably data frames and run inference, as well as automatically starting up those expansion services to make it easier to just kind of get going without necessarily doing manual steps like you, wouldn't, you would probably want to do for a more production environment. Um, and very briefly, like for in regards to data flow specific features, there's support for flex templates in the Go SDK, as well as using Cloud Profiler for your Beam Go pipelines. And that is the state of the Go SDK 2023. There is one last thing around timers that needs to be implemented before we can say it's properly done in regards to adding uh, on window expiry uh, so that you can finish cleaning up or handling your various callbacks for state. I actually have a hard time thinking of other things that are missing from the SDK at this time beyond additional IOs, additional working on supporting and maintaining our cross-language suite of IOs, and additional performance work, because we can always get things a little faster, can't we? Um, so in case you have not heard anything about Beam portability, I'm going to be even briefer on that. In Apache Beam, we have an abstraction in order to basically separate the idea of what the toolkit used to build your pipelines, the SDKs, and what, uses, and what those pipelines end up executing on. We call this divide uh, the fun API, and the idea of it is the whole idea of Beam portability. This prevents us from needing to write a combinatorial explosion of every pair of SDK and runner in order to support executing on these and on, on these various runners. So um, this is why I was aiming for a portable runner by itself when I was trying to write a 
new direct runner for the Go SDK. Uh, for a lot of logistical reasons, the Go SDK hasn't had a meaningfully fully featured direct runner experience uh, because during its development, uh, it was largely used internally to Google. And within Google, we would run everything against our big iron data processing thing called Flume. So there was never any real need to work on the Go direct runner itself. It was just the most expedient path, what we could do with the resources we had. But that meant that as the SDK garnered additional features, the direct runner was thus left behind and leading it to be a very suboptimal experience for open source development or even testing your own pipelines in general. This led to me having kind of a laundry list of goals for what a new, a new runner for Go would look like. Specifically, it definitely needed to be local. I didn't need to want it to have to deal with just distributing work around because we already have runners that do that, whether that is on Dataflow, whether that is Flink or Spark, or if Ray comes up with that or Samza, the, laundry, the list goes on. Um, it needed to be portable because the Go SDK was built with portability first. There has never been any kind of legacy runner for the Go SDK outside of the Go Direct runner. Um, so in order to, for it to avoid needing to have a bunch of different mechanisms in order to how to execute your do funds and pipeline components, it needed to talk through that uh, portable uh, function API, the fun API, which would then also let it talk to SDKs in any language, which then also lets it support all of cross language as well. Authored in Go, partly because that's just the way uh, I end up thinking about code these days. It's easier for me to think about it. Go also enables very simple concurrency, or has very simple concurrency primitives, and it makes it very easy to write something that executes concurrently and be able to manage that concurrency. So a lot of this was also just making sure that I was building something that I wish I had several years ago, frankly. Um, because for the longest time, we have had the Python direct runner and the Python portable runner. We used to have a Java universal runner, which was the original framework for uh, a portable runner. Uh, but neither of those were packaged in a way to make it kind of easy to just have anyone develop against them. It was fine if you were working within the Beam repo, but you needed to have everything about the environment set up properly. Like you needed to have all the right versions of Java, or you needed to set up your Python environment just so, otherwise virtual end would be very unhappy. Um, I personally have had bad experiences with virtual env such that I ended up needing to reinstall my Linux installation because uh, uh, operationally Python does not work for me at least. So I wanted a, it's like, and one of the advantages of Go by itself is that it can, it's very simple to compile to any particular target architecture. Reasonably, it's reasonable to make it so it does so portably, so you don't need to worry too much about link, dynamically linking in any particular Linux libraries or C libraries. Um, so that ideally it's just drop in, you can use it to submit your jobs to and then work. And then uh, ultimately, because it is a portable first runner and portable only runner, frankly, it means that if you did try and move things off to one of the bigger or runners that are do run portably, such as Dataflow, Flink, or Spark, it would catch these errors before you needed to run it against a large cluster. So those were overall the goals of the runner. But specifically uh, for doing that, I also wanted this runner to be quite a bit more configurable uh, with, through what I'm going to call variants. So in my talk last year, I was talking about how Beam is very powerful and has a lot of different abstractions for enabling you to scale things up. I talked specifically about like one particular optimization uh, called a combiner lifting. In order, in order to do that, the Beam portable API has a mechanism to turn, I have this combine into a bunch of different smaller steps so that you can lift that combine through a group by key and 
process your data that much faster before you send it off to some kind of a shuffle or grouping uh, primitive. Um, but different runners don't necessarily implement that. Uh, at least the last time I checked, it's not implement that optimization isn't implemented in the Flink runner. It is implemented in Dataflow. But that means your pipeline is executing different code in each of these runners, making them ill-suited for validating that your job is going, your pipeline is going to work, or any custom code you're writing is going to work between the two runners, unless you're testing them against that. When the only main difference is how the runner is optimizing your pipeline. So I wanted a runner that could also turn things on and off or enable them in different ways so you can fine tune the execution to match what your target production environment is a little bit better. So in these cases, like emulations. So I had a couple different ideas of how this could work. Um, the first one would be like the default test operation, which would do everything in its power to make sure that, every, that everything will encode properly. And each do fun can, um, can operate kind of independently in its own stage if necessary. Uh, so those different optimization choices made by other runners won't affect them as well, or won't affect them uh, poorly. Um, but also, because it's intended for test, it shouldn't need anything to really add resilience. Like, it shouldn't be retrying things, because ideally, you want your test runner to fail immediately when it comes into a problem, so that you can route out that kind of flake more effectively rather than have it papered over. Conversely, there should also be a fast mode, because features like, producer, like a fusion of between do funds are a feature of Beam, and how you make Beam fast on distributed systems like Dataflow and Flink. So it still needed to be able to do that, because it's still important, especially for any new SDKs, to implement that kind of primitive, or that kind of mechanism clearly and effectively. Um, and then, as I've already discussed, uh, Having specific is like having different variants that are kind of tailored to match the idiosyncrasies of different production runners, at least to a reasonable degree. Because as I said, this is going to be only a local runner. It's never going to deal with distribution. But in terms of how those runners treat Beam and Beam pipelines. So as stated there, Flink does not do combiner lifting. But it also doesn't do the state combine, state cache, which is one of those features that exists in Beam, but you've possibly never heard of it unless you're deep in the weeds for how an SDK is implemented. So very important for me as someone who's building an SDK, and probably very important for anyone who's working on the Rust SDK or the TypeScript SDKs. But if, all, if every time you're trying to test a specific feature, you have to pay six cents to Dataflow, you're probably not going to develop it as quickly as you really want, as much as, you know, I would love for you to run it all on Dataflow. <laughs> um, and then finally, I wanted to make sure that which variant your pipeline is operated on is set uh, by a pipeline option at uh, pipeline submission time, so that you could have different pipelines running against the same instance of this runner, running with whatever var which with a specific variant and executing in that fashion, so that you could possibly test a bunch of these combinations simultaneously without worrying about it too much. So uh, naming, one of the token hard problems of computer science, I came up with a lot of names in the brainstorming document I had. Um, and if you end up looking at the slides for this later, I have copy-pasted kind of like the justification and like why I dismissed a good number of these names uh, in the speaker notes for this slide. But, uh, I have a particular problem with why we, or that we call, uh, th we have a thing called the direct runner. And how many of you were thinking Python when I said that versus how many of you were thinking Java? It's very unspec, it's unclear about what you're talking about when you're talking about the direct runner, which is why I hate that as a name. And a lot of these different options kind of fall into that same problem. It's like if you're talking about the SDK, if I called it the, the SDK runner, it's like, what does that mean? If I called it the beam runner, what does that mean? <laughs> Ultimately, 
I leaned right into our wonderful metaphor of beam itself and selected prism. A diffraction prism uh, takes a beam of light and separates it out into its component uh, wavelengths. And so you can look at them individually. And so with the idea of the variance, uh, this kind of fell naturally. It's a very nice metaphor, and I like it. So I'm calling it, at least for now, the, the, the uh, formally, the Apache Beam Go Prism Runner, if you have to use the absolute full title, or just the Prism Runner for short. So it's at least ambig unambiguous when you're talking about it specifically. Don't know if it's going to be the full name forever, but for now, this will do. So in terms of features, right now, it can do pretty much most of the basics. Impulse flatten, group by key, co-group by key if your SDK supports it. You can do side iterables with either side inputs with map or iterable side inputs with your do funds, handle do funds with zero or more outputs, splittable do funds, process continuations for doing basic streaming things uh, locally, supporting both combiners both lifted and unlifted, although right now the default is lifted because those are more complicated. Uh, it collects logs. Execution is currently fully with loopback mode because adding things to execute through the containers is a little bit trickier, and I haven't had time to be able to do that. Um, oh, goodness. I didn't mention, I didn't include this in the slides, but I'll, include, I'll mention it here. It's like I do have full windowing support for all different kinds of windows. Uh, so global window, iter or iter or iterable ones, and session windows. Can't do merging windows. Ah, there's a feature that's not implemented in the Go SDK, custom window fonts. So eventually, someday. Uh, in progress, as I am working on it, because the Go SDK finally has full state and timer support, I am intending to add that to the, the Prism runner, uh, which will probably be one of the last things I need to add before I make it to the default runner for the Go SDK. Uh, similarly, test stream and triggers as primitives to support those. And as you'll see soon, uh, a standalone binary. So it's not just something that only exists in Go. It's something you could submit other jobs to. Uh, Docker execution, proper support for the variants I mentioned and uh, improving the metrics collection support. When it's complete, it should be able to test every part of Beam. So whether that is little esoteric, like little features that enable larger scale, pro uh, larger scale processing, like state-backed iterables or the state cache, or even just being able to test that your pipeline, that your custom drain code in your pipeline do fun actually does what you think it is in a pipeline context, or the built-in pub sub IO. Currently, is, is my understanding, there's either an SDK-based fallback for PubSubIO, or it's just fully subbed out like it is for Dataflow in many cases, and so on and so forth. The idea is to be able to test and execute every part of the Beam model, whether from the littlest detail that the user will see to the biggest thing that they don't see for performance reasons. So we're going to have a very quick demo here. Right now, don't have it installed. Uh, and I am going to cheat by not typing everything out. Uh, and for this particular demo, I'm not actually going to be rerunning what I'm installing here. Uh, this is just to kind of demonstrate how easy it is to install things from Go. If you have a recent Go installation, you can install it by just asking for the specific command path. In this case, I'm asking for at master as opposed to at latest or a specific version because the standalone binary wasn't committed until, to the repo until a week or two ago. So in this case, it is now going through the process of actually downloading and packaging everything up and installing everything. We're not going to wait entirely for this to finish before I move on. Over here, uh, this is just my current working state, because uh, I have a lot of in-flight changes for improving Prism here. Uh, but as you can see from the top here, I'm off in the command directory that I was installing before. So I'm just going to go ahead oops, and just spin up an instance of Prism, which we can go here. Voila, we have a fancy UI. No jobs have been run yet. Uh, 
And because I don't have a good example, I've decided to just send the test suite targeting it to uh, the Prism instance that we've got over here. Uh, just to run through the command line here, I'm literally just running go test. I'm telling it to run the specific suite of tests that do the separation harness, which is a way of testing that you can do dynamic splitting and so forth in Beam. Uh, I mean, targeting against any kind of universal runner, which this is what Prism will be. And so that's the actual endpoint that we can see started up over there. Uh, environment type is loopback because I wanted to talk directly back to this particular Go process in order to execute the pipeline. I believe all the SDKs have a loopback mechanism. Uh, and generally, this saves you from dealing with uploading and downloading things. Uh, there's an improvement I need to make to the Go SDK by default, but right now this is just overriding the worker binary that would be uploaded. Uh, in this case, usually Go will cross uh, the Go SDK will cross compile itself to be able to send that worker binary over, but we don't need that in loopback mode. And setting a timeout is just good practice if you don't want it to like overrun everything, and that's a flag for Go test. So we send all of that off, and as you can see. A bunch of uh, log is, logs are being produced. Uh, this is going to be cleaned up over time. Uh, but as you can see, a couple of pipelines ended up getting finished. And we still actually have one that's running. So back in our jobs console, uh, we have all the different jobs that we've run. And one is currently in progress of running. Again. This is the haphazard, quickly hacked up UI, which is, does not do anything with the graph structure as of yet, uh, but shows all the different transforms and the various inputs and outputs that they are getting and their current various element counts as per comes back through the very, from the SDK's portability mechanism. Similarly, we have them down here. Just a crazy happenstance that I happen to come in at exactly 50 here, but I refresh and a bunch of all the numbers increment because the pipeline is currently still running. The code that we're running for that particular test is just this pipeline here, which just has a periodic impulse, which uses process continuations. It will continue on for about five minutes and em emit an event every second, and every window is its own, or every, every interval of one second is its own window in this case. It does a simple passes it to a simple do fun, groups it, and then does something with that grouping. It doesn't, it's not doing anything in particular, it's just generating elements in this case. Let's see, one last thing. Did we finish installing that? Great, it started downloading a bunch of things here. And let's see here, which prism? Ah, we now have that binary. I won't start it up now because it would just override the thing. This was, again, just the demo of how easy it is to install <laughs> uh, if we haven't done that for you. The last bit to go over before I just go immediately to questions. Um, this is this the GitHub thing for the actual standalone binary. It's in the SDK's go command directory under prism. Uh, you'll see there's not actually a lot of code here. That ends up actually living off in the SDK in the runners directory where there is a large overview of what I've already talked about here, already discussed. And then just inside here is kind of how the runner is currently structured. Originally, all of this was set up entirely in one giant mono package. And then as I was submitting it, I broke it up into different components. So they're all relatively independent with their structure described in a lovely little readme file so that I can keep track of how everything works. Uh, and with that, uh, questions.